be okay with being wrong. A lot of times I'm okay with being wrong and I let him have the win, knowing that I'll get a win in another place. It's not always a competition and to see who wins. If you're okay with being wrong and you can put your ego aside, in a lot of circumstances, it really works to your advantage because you sort of bank it and then you could be right where you want to be right and where you need to be right. So you, it's maybe a little manipulation. Are you the mastermind manipulator here? I think that I know my husband better than anyone and I know exactly how to get him where I need him to be. Woo! <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Elena Cardone Show. Today we are in Austin, Texas. I am with the one and only Skinny Confidential, Lauren Bostic. She has the famous podcast, The Him and Her Show, that she does with her husband, Michael, who I had the great honor of just being on. So make sure you check that out. And today I cannot wait to pick your brain about all of your success how you do it all, what's going on in the world. And I've got my little pen. I'm taking my little notes because this is going to be good. If Michael tried to put me back in the Jack in the Box, we would divorce. What do you mean by never going back to Jack in the Box? What I mean by someone putting someone in a Jack in the Box is we all know these stories of, I'm going to say especially women, where the man wants to put them back in the box mm. and get in line with the idea of what he wants. And what I've realized is that's a control and security from a man. And he's projecting it onto the woman and he wants her to fit nicely and neatly in a box. And if I was dating or being married to someone that wanted to put me back neatly in a box, it wouldn't work for my relationship. That's what I mean by that. Did that explain it? Yep. Okay. Okay. What's the best advice for working with your spouse that no one really wants to hear? You you have to be okay with being wrong. A lot of times I'm okay with being wrong and I let him have the win, knowing that I'll get a win in another place. It's not always a competition and to see who wins. If you're okay with being wrong and you can put your ego aside in a lot of circumstances, it really works to your advantage because you sort of bank it and then you could be right where you want to be right and where you need to be right. So you, it's maybe a little manipulation. Are you the mastermind manipulator here? I think that I know my husband better than anyone, and I know exactly how to get him where I need him to be. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give moms who want to start their own business with young kids? I, this, this is blunt. I would say that that's an excuse. I have two young kids under I have a four year old and a two year old. And I think if you're using the children as an excuse, it's causing you not to execute on what you want to do. I would say this in any area, though, if you're if you're making an excuse for yourself, you have to have a real, real conversation with yourself. Is it an excuse or do you maybe not want to be doing it? If you actually want to do something, you're going to do it. So. To start a business with two young kids, the first step is to execute, create systems to get to the goals that you want. I would be very thoughtful about where you're putting your time. So for instance, if you want to write a book, is it on the calendar every single day, you 30 minutes writing? You're not going to, you don't, you can't just have these huge goals without the systems to get there. So I would wake up 30 minutes before my kids to write the book. That's how I, I mean, you, you could make it happen if you want to make it happen million that's blunt too blunt no it's not actually learned that early on like I found myself going oh we can't go because we had the kids and I caught myself and I went why am I blaming the kids that's so horrible I don't want to go but I used it as an excuse and then Grant it is a nice excuse though. we don't want nice to do excuse. something use but Grant and I vow we're like we're never saying or the reason is because of the kids that's smart I'm gonna do that yeah I sometimes will blame my kids too you see yeah. I know yeah so thank you for holding me accountable <laughs> How do you think TikTok and IG filters are harming us? You know, I get asked this question a lot. I don't care what anyone else does. Meaning if, if you decide to filter your entire face, I don't, it doesn't trigger me. I think that if filters are triggering to you, you have to examine why it's triggering. What I would say, because I have a daughter, 
is that I will will tell her as she grows up that TikTok and Instagram are a movie set. And there's lighting and there's filters and there's hair and there's makeup and there's prep and there's editing. So you have to look through it of a lens as you're watching a movie. And I think if you can look through it of that lens always, even as we grow up, even as I'm, you know, getting older, I look through it. This is a movie. I'm not watching a real thing. So the filters don't bother me too much. Yeah. I'm going to get eaten alive on TikTok. Eat me. (laughs) Would you have gotten the implants if you had to do it all over again? Yes, I would. I would have gotten the implants if I had to do it all over again. I think that there was a, a huge evolution and learning through the whole thing. And I think the story that I've been on has helped a lot of people. Um, and they were they're fun. I mean, listen, I'm not against implants. I think implants are great. I had them for 18 years. I just think they stopped serving me. Um, and I wasn't I wasn't feeling my best. But I don't have any vendetta against implants. If if they're not harming you, they're they're fun. Let's be honest. Why don't you look at the phone in the morning? Oh, I'm so passionate about this one. I'm really passionate about not looking at the phone in the morning. When you wake up and you're looking at your phone in the morning, you are reacting to what everyone else wants from you. You are not being proactive. So when you get up, you're checking your text, you're seeing who emailed. It's all reactive, reactive, reactive. And I want to be in a mode where I'm being proactive. So for me to be proactive and to have my best day, I need space so I can have clarity to wrap my head around what it is I need to do that's going to move the needle. And when you wake up and your phone is straight in your face, you're scrolling, you get distracted. For me, put I I grab my phone, I'll put on an audible book. So maybe I'm making the bed, I'm I'm cleaning my space, I'm doing my skincare, but I'm doing something that's productive and makes me smarter, better, faster. Maybe I'm listening to be obsessed or be average. But the point is, it's I, I don't want to be in the mud when I wake up. Also, it like hurts my eyes, too. It just I want to be. They have glasses yeah, for that just, now. Ugh. I want to be out in the sun taking a walk. Do you? What yeah. is your morning routine? My morning routine is light movement hydration. So I wake up, I open the shades, I hydrate, I get outside, it gets my hormones. I take a walk with my son, I'm I'm moving. And then I try to do this thing like a walking meditation. Melissa Wood Health has this one that you literally meditate for 16 minutes as you're walking. And it really sets the tone of the whole day. But I do not pick up my phone unless it's to turn on a meditation or an audible. That's it. But this has also been 13 years of being thoughtful. This is not something that just happened overnight. Do you wake up with anxiety? I don't. Okay, good. I don't. Well, what do you eat to stay so fit? Okay, I had to lose 60 pounds. Get I was 60 out. pounds heavier than this after. I, when I had my baby, I gained 60 pounds with both. So, like, I've really had to tap in how to lose weight. And the number one thing that I cannot even like stop talking about is weightlifting for women. The more muscle you build, your body composition is going to shrink. People think you bulk up, you shrink. I weightlift probably five days a week and I eat a lot of meat. And I'm, I have a, a certain blood type that does well with that. And I'm- Are like, you O? I'm O. That's why. And I'm disgusting with my meat. It's like a big bowl of meat. Like that's, that's how I've lost weight is meat and weightlifting. And it really, and I've tried everything because of the podcast, okay? I've tried everything. And those two things, they're so simple for women, are weightlifting, building muscle, and eating, for me, meat, whatever your, yeah, protein. Those two things. Yeah. That's how I lost 60 pounds. And I can't shut up about the weightlifting thing. Yeah, I'm with you. The muscle holds the body together. I'm convinced that you have to build the muscle. Also, don't you feel like it tightens your skin to the muscle, which makes you look younger than you are? Like, I feel like my my skin gets tighter around my muscle and it's more youthful than than being super thin without muscle. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Do you have a trainer? I have a trainer. Okay. I have to have a trainer. If you don't have a trainer, you're not disciplined, right? Please say you're like me. Please say yes. Please say yes. Um... I'm Ugh. a trainer helps me stay accountable, but I, I do. I like working out because 
it makes me feel better. Me too. The so, endorphins. Yeah. I love. If I didn't get that, I don't, I think Insane. I would be disciplined. Insane. Insanity. No, crazy lady. For for me anyway. What I have didn't ask you on our show. Can I ask you what you do for your workout? Well, I used to, I used to train MMA like an hour to two hours a day. I was very diehard about it. I've had multiple black eyes. Grant was furious at me because, you know, one could assume that he would be hitting me. Although I have it on camera where I have headgear on and I got punched and then you can see it. Like I've, I videoed it. You know what I mean? Oh the my accident. God. So people were thinking that it was like Grant and you had to show the video? No, I never had to show the video, but like, I think he was just, I don't want to say what I think he was thinking, but he was really upset with me, not my trainer. He, he probably didn't want to see you hurt either. That's right. Yeah. And he was like, gosh, you know, you're my beautiful wife and like you're walking around with black eyes. Like what a badass. And I tore my calf muscle, like completely torn. So it atrophied. That was that wasn't even fighting with a person that was kicking a heavy bag. So that was a little embarrassing. But anyway, that's what I used to do. So I used to do weightlifting and then I would majorly train that way. And now I gave that up and I'm really determined to get back in the saddle with at least weightlifting, Pilates. I don't know if I'm going to go back to the to the boxing, MMA, kick fighting thing, but that is my favorite. So you like weightlifting the best too? No, I hate weightlifting. I only do that because they wouldn't continue to train me in MMA unless I did the weightlifting because they said that I was becoming strong enough to where I could do damage if I didn't have the muscle to support the impact. Do you, but do you like the results of weightlifting? Yes. Okay. And I know it's good for you, but I hate it. Like I, I hate it. I love training in a, in a ring. I hate weight training. That's interesting. You probably, is it like sparring that you like? Yeah. Makes sense. But I like combinations too. Like sparring is when you kind of free, you know, when you kind of freestyle with a trainer and you're sparring, that's really difficult because I can never end up hitting them. But when do, you're doing combinations and they're holding it's like the a pads. Dance. Yeah, that I really like because it takes so much coordination and you really have to hone in and it's just not natural for me. So when I was really doing that, it, it, A, it was humbling. B, I was feeling stronger. I could confront more in my life because I'd wake up and do that every single morning so, so that everything you. else seemed easier. The endorphins, it gave me a high. I was never really great at it. I would never compete or anything. I mean, it was just, it was just a... A, I did it for self-defense. If something were to happen, I wanted to stand a chance to get away. Whereas before I started training, I was in a I was in a fight class. I was actually in a shooting class. I was the only girl, but they had a fight portion. And when I did the fight portion, I realized I, I can't survive. Like I'm dead. Like I, I don't even know what, what I'm doing. I could be very quickly overwhelmed quickly, physically. That's what made me start training. So the training gave me like, a 5% confidence in myself that I could get away. At least I'm not as scared and I know things that I can do. I mean, you yeah, know? I need to get into fighting. It's so fun. But I mean, anyway, fi fighting, though, fighting, uh, that's a good one to know. Especially BJJ, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, if you could actually master that, forget I thought it. you were going to say something else with BJ. I was like, we're no, going to do blowjob no, tips after we're not, this? Perfect. We're not doing blowjob okay. tips. I mean, you can, I'm not. <laughs> But Brazilian jiu-jitsu, when a woman really masters that, which I didn't, but I did train it a little bit, but you can take down a tall, huge, strong man when you really understand that because you use their body weight and it's gravity. Like if you know the right thing to do, you can take them down and escape or choke them out or whatever. I need to take that. You do. Yeah. It is Amazing. I'm literally going to look into classes. That sounds fun. It is so fun. I need something to train do on my with two a days black off. belt, though, because if you train with another white belt, a they don't know that they could hurt you. If it, there are certain moves that don't seem like they do much that could really hurt you, and b you don't need somebody trying to prove something like oh I'm a, on you. Like well, it has to be a black belt. Well, that's my I trained with a black belt because I didn't want to get hurt. I just wanted to learn and become a badass for myself, not to like be some whipping board for some other chick trying to figure out, you know, that she's strong. Got it. I, you know I think I mean? I'm going to look up Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu 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 BJJ. BJJ. I'll remember that. And black belt. And then I'll be able to whoop Michael's ass. 
Oh, if you did that, oh, for sure, yeah. hands down. But that takes years. But that's that good. That's another good. layer to the onion. That's a good, that's a I good like purpose. Okay. But if you take MMA too, you'll learn those kicks. I mean, it's- And you can just whack his head off. I think- Kick him in the stomach. Pow, pow, pow. I love it. I love it. Okay. All right, I'm getting in. back, getting back. Come on, you got me sidetracked. Don't I do that. It. Don't do that. No, you just inspired me, me to fight. I'm like, oh, jeez. Okay, uh-huh. here we go. Um, What is- the number one favorite podcast guest that you have had and tell us a story we don't know. I love surprising people with the guest. And what I mean by that is I like when someone has labeled someone and given them this is who they are and and, and sort of like projected their own narrative onto the guest. And then the guest comes on and you see a completely different side of them. That's my favorite type of guest. And, someone, and who has that been? Dan Bolzarian. Oh, really? Oh. So first, I read his book, which is all about, like, getting and dating and fucking all these women. And I found him to be very smart with the way he approaches things. And he had a lot of good points in a lot of areas. And I really enjoyed his book. And then I reached out to him, and he was so lovely which was like, that was really like surprising. And then meeting him and interviewing him in his home was a trip. He showed us around his whole bathroom. He had dinner with us. We got to see what he eats. He's very strong. And he was really like just a lovely person. And his interview, I thought, showed a completely different side of him that people hadn't seen. So he was one of my favorite guests. And we just had Elena on our podcast and she was great too. Okay, well, that leads me to the second question. What is the second favorite guest that you've had? And tell us a story we don't know. Elena just came on our podcast. It was absolutely amazing. It was even better than her TikTok, if it can get better. I liked having you on because I learned a lot about how to maneuver within a marriage when you're wanting to build an empire. I think that you don't meet couples like you and Grant every day. And I love to see the infrastructure and the inner workings of it. And I think it was interesting to see how you guys manage business, children, building an empire, becoming a billionaire. Like I love to see the back end and how it became this vision. So that was my second favorite. Woo! (laughs) Well, that's my personal favorite. (laughs) So uh, who was your third favorite podcast guest? And tell us a story that we don't know. Robert Greene was amazing. He wrote 48 Laws of Power and his book was banned in jails because it was a handbook that prisoners were using to gain power within the system. And his book is it's banned a lot of places. He also wrote The Art of Seduction. He wrote The Laws of Human Nature, and he's fascinating. And he came on. And a story that people don't know is that when I was podcasting with him the whole time, I was like, wait, how's my body language? How's am I being seductive enough? Like you're constant. He's so good at the inner workings of people that you start to question yourself, which is a real trip when you're interviewing someone. Whoa. All right. Who is the fourth favorite podcast guest? And tell us a story that we don't know. Michelle Pfeiffer. Catwoman. Sorry. She's just so iconic. And the best thing about her is so many celebrities have 10 different people with them. They come in with literally 10, sometimes 15 different people. Hair, makeup, lighting. And she came in with no one, which is like you think she'd come in with like at least some I mean when I go to a podcast I come in with someone she came in with no one she was so down to earth she was so open she was so approachable and she was cool so that's my fourth oh my god I love these names love her as an actress okay if you had to start over today with five hundred dollars what would you do I would Elena it and make my money work for me I I think that if I had to start over with $500, my first order of business would be figuring out what my foundation is. And I think when I first started with literally $500 13 years ago, my first order of business was to build a blog and to build it aesthetically pleasing so people wanted to look at it. 
Now with $500, I think you can build an Instagram account and you can microblog through Instagram. And what I would spend the money on, probably whatever the brand is that I wanted to create. So if I wanted to show off my cooking, which I'm a horrible cook, but if I did, I would buy the supplies to cook so I could create content. And then I would microblog through Instagram and I would microblog through Instagram stories and I would slowly build a community. But I would not look for more followers. I would focus on the people that were already following me and let them go be the soldiers. So if you have 100 followers, stop focusing on getting 100 more. Focus on who you have. I think that's a big um, a big unlock if you're just starting out and you don't have a lot of money. So focus on who's in front of you. How are you different today than you were when you were getting started? I mean, everything's different. I think that I think that there's a lot of people online that will say, you said this two years ago. I am free to change my mind. I change my mind every day. I hope I'm changing my mind. And I've evolved. When I first started blogging, I was a bartender. I was broke. I was attending San Diego State. I was literally living with someone for free because I couldn't afford to live anywhere else. And I was uh, just dating Michael. So I've evolved. And I think there needs to be grace for people to evolve. I, I don't need to be the same person that I was at 21. Um, and so I think that I've I've gotten wiser. I've gotten more logical. Um, hopefully I've gotten much smarter and um, maybe more stoic. And I think I've evolved as a wife and a mother. What is the one thing that you can't stand about your husband and why do you put up with it? Let me pull out my scroll. No, I'm just kidding. What is the actually the one thing I can't stand? It's it's only one thing really is he is very impatient and he when he ruminates on something, he wants it right away, but it could be a good quality too. So when he ruminates, he's like a bloodhound. It's like we have to talk about it and he has to narrate it and we have to go over it and like he's waking up with it and he's going to sleep with it. And it's like and it's being that support beam, like you said, on the podcast. And sometimes that can be exhausting. However, I can see it can also be a good thing, too. And I think it's helped him to become successful. Mm. What advice would you give a single mom struggling right now that has a dream? I think it's doing your children a disservice to not execute on whatever that dream is. I, I think that a lot of people will say, oh, I'm being selfless, but it's selfish for you not to execute on whatever that vision is. And I think it's selfish to your kids not to, to execute on it. I would say you have to put on your oxygen mask first. And I think I'm a better mother because I am I'm able to do what I want to do when I want to do it when it comes to my business. I think that I would be a little bit less of a mother if I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do. So you, you have to figure out a way to make it happen, no matter what your circumstances. You would never compromise your work for children? No. And, and you know why? I think I've listened to and read a lot of books and listened to people like you who have talked like I think you you have to listen to people that have gone through the process and at points felt like they did compromise to understand that I would and you tell me I feel like you feel like your whole self now that you've stepped into your power as an entrepreneur and you could I mean you could tell me more but I think when you feel your best in every area you show up better as a wife and a mother listen if you someone wants to be a stay-at-home mom and, and be a a single mom, I think that you have to do whatever you want. But if you're not able to fulfill your dream, it feels very stifling. So I think it's a, about just weighing the outcome over time. And if you want to make something happen and you have a dream, you should make it happen. Yeah, it's like the oxygen mask on a plane. Yep. Got to put it on yourself first. 100%. Otherwise, what message are you sending to your kids to compromise on your goals and your dreams? Yep. And integrity rather than get them on the mission with you in yep. agreement. I, 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 I do agree with you. So what gets Lauren fired up every day? 
I'm fired up by creating something out of nothing. Like, I love the fact that we just met in person two hours ago and we've created, in my opinion, beautiful content. I love the fact that my product line, I'll take an idea that I have in my head. I won't white label it. I'll create it from scratch and my audience will open it and they're like, oh my God, this is better than I thought. I love just creating, it could be content or product out of nothing. That lights me up. So what did creating the hot mess ice roller do for you and your family? We have one for you over there. Yes. It? What it did is that I had a horrible, horrific jaw surgery where I was swollen for four years. And when I say swollen, it was like the worst thing. You've, it was like my face was out to here for four years. Like for real? I'll show you a picture. You won't even believe. We can put a picture up too. It's like wild. And I had an identity crisis because I couldn't mm. use my face. Which is interesting when a lot of the time as a bartender, you lead with your face. Very humbling. Um, so the only thing that helped was ice. And there was no ice rollers on the market that was doing what I needed. So that's sort of how that came out of a necessity. And then the audience helped me build every single touch point of it. We have the hot mess ice roller. And it's helped your family in what ways? How has it helped my family? Well, I think it's it's helped my family from a perspective of I get to do what I think is my calling, which is creating. So I've showed up as a better mother and a wife. And obviously, from a money perspective, that's been unbelievable. And I think it's helped me show up for the community in the way that they've built it with me. So it's very, I feel like it's very, um, it makes me feel purposeful, mm. which makes me, again, show up as a better teammate. And what makes you so passionate about self-care? I think every single woman should should lean into self-care. We had this... Um, Jesse Itzler. His mm. wife is uh, Sarah. Spanx. Sarah Blakely. Sarah Blakely. Mm -hmm. Come on the podcast. And he said he's like, he's best friends with a billionaire. And he said that the billionaire said that he spends three hours a day throughout the day on himself. So maybe that means weightlifting for an hour, taking a walk for a half an hour. I don't know whatever else he does. Like he just collectively throughout the day, there's three hours. So it could be different pockets. Maybe he meditates for an hour. And I think to show up and be your best and be efficient and be strong in a business, you have to have that element. Sleep to me, number one. I look like a hot mess if I'm not sleeping. Like I have to do these things so I can show up with clarity and confidence to be the best that I can. So self-care to me, like it's non-negotiable. So reflecting on your personal growth journey, um, what bold moves have you made that significantly shaped the woman that you are today? Uh, quitting my job. Mm. That was a big one. Mm -hmm. I think that being an oversharer and outspoken in a space that can sometimes try to, I don't want to say silence, but it can try to put you in a box. I also think being disruptive with product, product innovation, and really telling it how it is on our podcast. I think we really show up on the podcast as who we are in pe in person. And I sort of pride myself on that because you you never know with right on online. You never know. That's right. And I think that with our podcast, we've really been able to show up as we are, who we are, and tell it how it is. Would you say there has been a misconception about you or your brand that was amusing or surprising to you? or And if so, how did you handle it or address it? Not surprising. I get it. I get that I'm not for everybody. I get people see the pink and they want to be like, oh, this this girl's a dumb shit. I get I used to have huge boobs like I used to be blonde, super blonde, bleach blonde. And I, I get I get it. But I think that I'm kind of in on the joke. And you mentioned on our podcast, like about the gold digger thing. Yeah. Sometimes it's amusing to like be in on it mm -hmm. and understand it. And I can understand why people come to the conclusion. 
But I love to be underestimated. It's one of my, it's like, I honestly, like, it's sick. I love it. It, it And I use it to my advantage. Million. Like, if it's I'm a in weapon. a meeting with all men, let them underestimate oh, me. Oh, million. It's like, it gives you the upper hand, the advantage. No one's looking. Use it as leverage. Love that. Yeah, I mean, you. I, if I can, like, have someone think in a meeting that I don't know what I'm doing or I don't know how to negotiate, let them think that. <laughs> oh, it's been your biggest setback. My biggest setback has probably been from going to a solopreneur to an entrepreneur. Mm. I I was someone who worked in a silo, worked in a bubble. And to lead a team was a real challenge for me at first. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and it was like a baby deer learning to walk. It's been a work in progress. Another setback has been the identity crisis I had after I had that jaw surgery that was really difficult to not be able to show up on camera and I would look at myself in the mirror and I didn't recognize myself and it was really it like did something to my brain where it was like almost like a body dysmorphia but with my face um and then gaining 60 pounds twice and having to be on camera was not very fun but I look at it and like I really feel like I've unlocked the code to how I lose weight. And so to be able to share that with other people about weightlifting has been really exciting. So with every setback, you try to repackage it into something that's positive. So you asked me the question, how do I manage it all? How do you manage it all? I mean, it's a work in progress. I I am a psycho about the way I look at time. If I have to do five conference calls, I better be getting a blowout and my makeup done at the same time and maybe my nails. I mean, I want to go through the car wash. Right. Like, it's got to be everything is a moment to maximize my time. And people are like, it's not good to multitask. I don't multitask. I passively multitask. That's different. So what I'll do is I will return emails while I'm walking on the treadmill. I will get a blowout while I type emails. I will get my nails done while I have 10 calls. And I do that because then I have the time and the space to show up for my kids how how I how I want to. And if I were to try to pack all of this into a day and not habit stack it, it wouldn't work. So I really look at every single day I wake up and say, how can I maximize this day with my time? I'm really serious about time. I do have to work on being on time. That's a work in progress. But I try to plan from when I'm reading to when I'm showering to when I'm dry. I have driving time in my calendar. I try to set alarms. 15 minute meetings. We don't need an hour meeting. I'm sorry. Like, no. Yeah, it's got to be curt. We got to get to the point. Um, and so I just really try to look at time through a lens of like, how can I get three days in one? <laughs> Dude, I'm the same way. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all with all you have going on. Yeah. Because you have like all these different businesses that you have to. Oh, my God. I mean, how? The, uh, my, oh my question God. to you is, do you theme a day? Like, is Monday like, is Monday like the supplement day and Tuesday's like the podcast day? Or are you just going back and forth with all these different things? Yeah, I'm working. I'm a work in progress, too. I'm working more on that. But I've actually spent a day now where I do all my one on ones with the team members and I try to do multiple podcasts all in one day. So I don't have to get the hair and the makeup every single day. It's one day and we do five different ones, like you said. So I'm just trying to be um, efficient with my time as well, like conservation of time to be highest and best usage. So again, so I can make time and create time for the family. It's definitely something that you have to like learn as you go. Yeah. It's not, I don't think it's someone someone's innately born with. Right. It's funny. I'm, I'm reading Donald Trump's book, Nothing Political. I just, I'm fascinated. Which one? The Art of the Deal? Not, it's the one that he wrote. Like, I think it's called How to Make Money. Oh, okay. How to Be a Billionaire, maybe. How to Be a Billionaire. Okay. And I'm reading it because I am interested in before he was president. Mm -hmm. And he has all these chapters on how he thinks about time. And it's wild. He's like 15 minutes, 15, every 15 minutes, it's something. And like, mm -hmm. 
it's really fascinating to see how he's been able to accomplish, whether you like him or not, oh. honestly, no politics. Agree. It's just interesting to see how he schedules his day. Mm -hmm. It's wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good that you're learning from mentors, though. Do you believe in that? Mentors? Yeah. Well, well not, you know, I don't know if you want to call him a mentor. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I mean, like people that have done it to fast track your way to success. Obviously, whether you like the guy or whoever we happen to be talking about, whether you like him or not, there's stats there. There's statistics there that no matter how you feel about a person, you can't deny. You can't argue the stats. 100%. That's what I'm saying. So, you, you know, he racked the stats, right? So, it, like, do you believe in that? Do you try to fast track your way to success by going, let me study with somebody who has something that I want to try to attain entrepreneurial or relationship or whatever you happen to be looking for. Do you do that? Do you make it a habit? Why do you think I invited you on the podcast? Oh, what? maybe a little what? selfish for myself. Oh, no, I, I do think, too. Yes, uh, absolutely. I think when you say when you say mentor, I think of it a little bit differently in the sense that I would never, ever DM you to pick your brain for coffee ever, because why would I do that when there's millions of pieces of content online. I find that to be lazy and self-indulgent. Like, what does that mean? DM you for coffee? Like, oh, meaning I would coffee? never DM you and say, hey, can I pick your brain for uh, can we have coffee? I'm in Miami. Can I can I pick your brain for 30 minutes? I wouldn't do that. I would say, hey, let me give you a plus side. Come on the podcast. So it's worth your time. Mm. So the way I learn from mentors is like take Ed Milet. I think that that he's he's awesome. I don't like go to him and ask him all these questions. I'll go listen to his content and consume his content. Grant read his book. You know what I mean? Like I'll read their books. I'll consume their content. I'm not like having a one on one. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then when you get in front of the person, you can actually ask interesting, intelligent questions that they know that you ask because you actually listen to their content. Yes. And then you actually stand out because you're not asking the generic question that's like, OK, obviously you haven't heard a word I've said because I said it a thousand times on all my free videos and this and that. You know what I'm saying? Yes. 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 And how boring is it to go to an interview and the person like has no. Con I mean, someone interviewed me the other day. They were talking. I, I, don't, I was like, this person has no idea of any questions. It's just like it's not a good interview for them or for me. Yeah. It's when I invite someone on the podcast, it's someone I've consumed their content religiously. Wow. I try. I mean, I, I try to read their book. Like, I really try to, like, investigate who it is we're interviewing. So the mentors that I have are mentors in my head. Mm -hmm. They don't know that they're my mentor. Yeah, I get it. No, I love that because you do the work. A lot of people want to complain about, oh, it's this, it's that, it's the kids. I don't have time. It's this or that. But how much time could they consolidate by not watching the non-contributing Netflix and listening to a podcast or listening and actually getting data that ignites an idea. When I listened to my Audible, I listened, I'm in my age of learning this year. I'm calling it my age of learning. So I'm like revamping everything, going back to basics, learning everything. So I'm on these Audible books too. Um, anyway, I, I don't know what I was going to say. No, Audible is such a great way to have like a mentor and you can do it sort of at your disposal. Like if you want to do it while you're making the bed or fold, like folding laundry, whatever you're doing, you can do two things at once, which I think is amazing. Even while I'm like making my kids dinner, I can just turn it on. And it's like having a mentor in your pocket. Right. You know, there's a lot of excuses, like you said, that are happening. If you're constantly making excuses, you got to ask yourself why. Right. Because a lot of people say they will do whatever it takes, but then they really don't. And it's something simple, like what we're talking about right now. It's listen to John Maxwell's The Laws of Leadership or Effective Leadership or or Be Obsessed or Be Average or, you know, or your book or what. I got to listen to John Maxwell's. I've never heard of that. Oh, really? No, I'm going to download it. I'm going to download it right away after this. Oh, I have to, I, I have a whole list of books. We should share. Can you tell me all the books that you're reading? OK, I would love that. I am not reading books, honestly. I'm yeah, yeah, I listen. OK, you know, my favorite. I just have to say this one thing is when people DM me on Instagram because I'll post a book I'm reading and they'll say, how do you have time to read? And I write back. If you weren't watching my Instagram story, that would be five minutes of you reading. 
if you're constantly scrolling content, you have time to read or listen to an audible book. I don't buy into I don't have time. I don't I don't like that. Me you either. make time for what you want. Exactly. So I, I made that decision a year ago that I needed to read more books. Well, in my case, audible books. But um, so, yeah, last year I did 36 books. I woke up like you said, which, you know, and then this year I have my target is 50. Damn. So it, and, and if you have time. Well, I woke up early. Now, I did compromise the workout. And now I'm coming back to the workout because now that was my excuse. Well, now I'm doing my education learning piece so I can cut that out. And it was really me just being lazy. So I'm really like, OK, I can do both. I can I can wake up earlier. I can reorganize my time because you can do anything you want. I just didn't want to. I didn't make it a priority. What like if- I stopped saying I can't or make an excuse and any little thing that I've done. And now I say I didn't make it a priority. You look like you work out every day. Oh, I love you. You do. You look like you work out every day. That's why. Well, I'm like, going to get back to it. You know what you could do, too, if you wanted? <laughs> this is so weird. You could get a trainer that lets you listen to an audible book while you work out. I don't know if I'd be able to concentrate or hear what they say. You think that you could? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe if they like didn't speak, I don't know. I'm like, shh. Don't talk. I know. <laughs> don't you remember talk. that movie? Um, okay, we're we're wrapping up here, but like I have two more questions. How important is a team to you? So important. But a team, a team doesn't just have to be like a work team. It could be like what you said on our podcast. Like it could be your family unit team. Mm-hmm. A, t- a, a team is a lot of different things to me. You have to have a team. I I'm as someone that you have to delegate. If you want to build any kind of empire, there has to be a team. Million. And then again, last question. Talk to me about your inner circle. Do you have standards? Who gets to be in the inner circle? Is it big? Is it small? Like, tell me a little bit about how, who gets to make it through the gatekeeper? Are you the gatekeeper? Is Michael the gatekeeper? Like, who gets to come into the inner circle empire? My husband is very good at reading people. He's he's a fourth Japanese. He's very he's very good at at observing. Um, so he's been a, a very good compass for me. Mm. I have not always been the the best at deciphering who can be in the inner circle. But I would say in the last five years after the pandemic, I cut anyone who was toxic. Oh, yeah. And I don't uh, I actually <laughs> I don't like to cut people. I like to slowly back away. Mm. I find that it's it's a little easier on both the ends. Transition. Yeah, just a slow transition. Um, but the, the, my inner circle is people that I've known for a long time or it's people. But you've known them for a long time. So they they get their godfathered in. No, no. It's people that I've known for a long time that also evolve. You got to evolve. If you're not evolving, I can't I can't carry dead weight along and I don't expect them to carry dead weight if they thought I was dead weight. But I also have people that I've that I've met on the podcast that are so inspiring where we understand each other that I've that I've met. I think that it's kind of a medley. It's a mix, but it is small. And I think what I've realized is I don't want to go get tons more new friends. I want to focus on the friends that I have or the business relationships that I'm building I want to show up as a good friend and you can only do so much in a day. If you have a friend that wants you to be at every birthday party and every Friday night and drinks, I'm going to disappoint them. And I'm very self-aware of that going into a friendship. I'll give you an example. Like if there's a mom at school that I meet that wants me to do all these things, go to the park three times a week or go for drinks every Friday night, I'm probably not going to be the friend she wants. Um, and so I'm I'm I think my picker has been more refined as I've grown up. You're amazing. I, I absolutely love you. And and I I just think you're gorgeous. Like I'm like, I hope this woman doesn't like like weird re- be weirded out the fact that I'm like oh, like, like I'm mesmerized by how you look. I'm like, okay, so Elena, stop. I'm like, oh, oh my, my god, god, she's so this- beautiful. The skin on your forehead, your eyebrows, like your eyes, your skin. I'm like, oh, my God, you are so stinking gorgeous. Thanks. It's like I think the same about you. 
I do. I mean, geez, I really look up to you. I think that there there's there needs to be more women like you speaking out about everything that you've done behind the scenes. And I loved having you on our podcast. Your team is great. Go team. Yeah. Two, two for the record, not 10, not two. 15, two. Two is I had acceptable. Two. two. Can we not do 15? 15. We have two. Okay, so two's the limit. Two is a good two I'm is in. a good number. Okay. That's what I show up with. Two. Oh, you show up with two too? I show up with two because one yes. for content to help me with That's the content. Right. And one to just streamline everything. Yeah. Yeah. One to just help me with my life. You know, there's so much going on in here. You know that movie Sleeping with the Enemy? I know what you're talking about. Is that with Glenn Close? No, that was with Julia Roberts. Okay, she yes, was yes, sleeping yes, yes, with yes, the enemy. Yes, yes. And he had all the rose and everything. And he was so what's it called OCD or whatever you call that where every label I'm like that's how I want my life like I want that because I need this to not show up in this world like th this is enough for me you know who we need to get on our show Chris Jenner because we need to understand I I told I told Michael I'm like I don't care about the gossip I want to know how she runs the inner workings of her day because everything is perfect and labeled and- Oh, it's labeled? Oh, I'm like, gonna send you a picture of a refrigerator. You're gonna freak out. Oh, that's what I want from my life. I, am I crazy? I want no. I want sleeping with the enemy. You know what? It's it, you're, you're so, you're processing so much on a high level that you just need peace in your outer area because it's chaotic. Yes, yeah. I need I get organization. It. I can't, I can't handle it anymore. I'm like, oh my God. I get because it. Because I can't do it myself. So no. I'm at the point now where I need help with somebody else helping it be organized for me. Because do you have anyway, an organizer? I'm, 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 I'm starting to get that in place. I have an organizer that I can send you guys. She's amazing. Her name's Reorganize on Instagram. She just did Paris Hilton's house. You should fly her to your house. She will come in and she will do it all. She okay. did my my pantries. She did. Yeah. I'm going to send you. Do you have labels? At psycho. I'm going to show you. You have psycho label? Psycho. Oh, God. Gotta come to It psych. helps me be more productive. Meditate in your kitchen <laughs> looking at labels. How I would think you would have everything methodically placed. We're getting there. Okay. We're getting there. I'm, I'm about re to remodel my entire house. Yeah. She, she'll come and in. when it comes, when it gets back, I think it's going to be killer. I think, and I think it's going to stay killer because now I'm getting the right people in place who understand that life and that. You have to. She, she, this is, I thought this was a good one. She told me she did Kobe Bryant's house and Kobe Bryant sat her down afterwards and said, oh. I want to tell you this. You have added years to my life because everything is so streamlined and I know where everything is. And he said, you you haven't given me the gift of organization. You've given me the gift of time. And when she said that, I was like, he's so it's it should be productive at a level that you want to play in. You have to. I love Kobe and I love that message. And every time I've ever heard him speak in an Instagram or, or an interview, he blows my mind. That man was unbelievable. Yep. So thank you for sharing that story. Thank, Thank you, for you for being on the Elena Cardone show today. Thank you Again, bringing it to you. Ba bam. <laughs>